Hello and welcome back to another episode of RGM. In today's episode we're going to be taking a nostalgic look back at Sony's first ever digital camera to come to the market with flash memory. This was back in 1997. And here it is, the Sony DSC F1. This was $850 when it came out back in 1997, so it wasn't cheap. This worked out around £600 in English money. Boasting 4 megabytes of internal flash memory, this would allow you to store up to 30 pictures in fine mode, 58 in standard, and 108 in snapshot. With an imaging chip of just 0 0.31 of a megapixel, screen resolution was just 640 by 480. It also has a colour LCD screen on the back, so you have live mode. You can also view your photographs back instantly and rotate them. One thing to note about this camera, there is no optical viewfinder, so on a bright sunny day the screen can be slightly difficult to see. When I think about it, it still fascinates me even today that you can take a photograph and view it back instantly and even print it. But of course, things weren't always that way. When you look back through history, man's been recording images for thousands and millions of years. The first drawings were on cave walls, etched in stone, tapestries and oil paintings. And then in 1820, the first photograph was taken and it took eight hours to expose. A quick Google search of the history of photography brings up Wikipedia, where it talks about some of the previous attempts to record an image. But the first image using a camera wasn't recorded until the mid-1820s by this chap here. Joseph Nisifion Nips, a French inventor born in 1765. He died at the age of 68 in 1833. And here is his first photograph on the left hand side. The image on the right is a colourised version. For some strange reason the image on the left is actually the wrong way round on the website Wikipedia. So here it is, the correct way round. You can now clearly see that it is the same photograph. It's absolutely amazing that it's managed to survive this long. And this image was actually taken between 1826 and 1827, not 1820 that I mentioned before. And then not long after that came along daguerreotype and wet plate photography. And then in the 1890s, Eastman Kodak celluloid film became available and became more popular. Ever since that first photograph was taken, man's been looking at different ways to record images. And then in the 1950s, the age of digital photography began. In 1957, the first digital image was produced through a computer by Russell Kirsch. It was an image of his son. But it wasn't until 1975 that the first digital camera was invented by Kodak. And here it is the world's first digital camera. It was invented by Steve Sasson, an engineer at Kodak. The first digital camera recorded a black and white image of just 0.01 megapixels. It recorded the image onto a cassette tape and it took around 23 seconds to capture one image. And here is an image of that picture on the TV screen on the right, being loaded via tape on the left into the computer to be displayed on the television itself. Well, I think that's enough of the history lesson. Let's get back to the Sony F1. Okay, let's take a look at the box. Um, the artwork strikes me actually as being quite unusual for Sony. Uh, working for Sony for 13 years, I don't really remember the days when their artwork was like this. Um, the box has obviously changed quite dramatically soon after this. So a thicker car, this is quite thin and it's very easy to squash. Got the system requirements there on the back. We've got the Windows 95 or 3.1. Wow. Uh, processor 386 or greater, 8 meg of RAM, 40 meg hard disk space, serial port, monitor with VGA, 640 by 480 or higher, graphics color 256 colors or more, and a CD ROM drive to install the software and the supplied applications. Um, even Mac OS uh, is on here as well at 7.1 or higher. Processor 68030, 6 meg of RAM, 40 meg hard disk space again, QuickTime 1.5 or higher, serial port monitor with 640 by 480, and 256 colors again, and the CD ROM drive. Well, simpler times back then, wasn't it? 
Um, it'll be quite interesting actually to try this out on the Windows 3.1 machine. But uh, I shall be trying it on Windows 98 today. So uh, let's take a look inside, shall we? Let's see what we've got. Oh, that's the power brick. It's one of those big heavy ones. It's with a guarantee card in German. PC connecting kit. The days when you used to get instructions to install software. Well, the main instruction manual there. 1997. What I like about Sony stuff, they always put the date on things on the instruction manual so you can date it quite easily. Showing a picture there of a standard PC, but you can tell it's a CRT, a Sony CRT there, Trinitron, because of the uh, shape of the screen. Uh, Excellent photo, there must be some software you get with it. Wow. Take your photos further. Watercolour, special effects, drawings, oil paintings. Guarantee card. That's be the software disc and the, and the drivers. 1996 on there. Case. Serial cable. Lip 10 lithium ion battery. Oh, that's the serial adapter for the Mac. So you'll plug that end in there, and that'll go into the Macintosh. So you use the DIN plug on the Macs. Composite video lead, and the camera itself. Wow, it's amazing how it's still got all the packaging. Someone's uh, taking good care of that. The It's a Sony logo there, slightly worn off. It's the infrared port. Got macro mode there. Video out, DC in, digital I.O. That'll be for the uh, serial cable. Menu, it's the jog wheel menu type system. Got a lock mode as well. So that, what that's for. It's still turning. It makes it, it grips it actually slightly. Power. Got a play off automatic manual camera mode. Battery goes in. Okay, let's have a look at some of the settings and see what we've got. Press the display button, that brings up how much memory you've used, what's left, and what mode you're in, fine mode there. Press it again, it tells you you've taken 38 photographs out of a possible 46, and your date and time. Press the menu button, go exposure auto. You can change that then. Got a little jog wheel on the side that you press in basically. Shutter speed, so you've got a choice of 100, 250th, or 500, or 1000th of a second. Record mode, single, continuous, time machine, multi screen. Quality, fine, standard, or snapshot. Flash adjust, date, um, wireless on or off, because on the front there you've got uh, an infrared port, which is what the earlier computers used, so you can send things via infrared. Quite slow, but uh, it works, and you can change the um, speed there at the bottom. So 38400, 19200 or 9600. And that's that's the menu. And that's all in manual mode you, you access that from. You turn it to automatic. Um, I think it doesn't work at all. It's fully automatic basically. Got a timer button there. Rotate. Skip backwards and forwards. Play. And flash on and off. And the exit button. Um, underneath, you've got a brightness there, so you can adjust the brightness of the back LCD panel and a tripod mount. And if we turn the dial on the side there to play, you can then view back the photographs that you've taken. Um, you can rotate them as well. 
So to do this back then was quite a big thing. Cameras before this even they didn't have screens on them. Um, you just pointed and shooting and just hoped and prayed you got a picture. And once you filled up that massive 4 megabytes of internal flash memory, you were going to need somewhere to store your photographs. You had two options back then. Either printed them with a Sony DPP M55 printer by infrared, or transferring your pictures to your computer, if you were lucky enough to have one. And today I will be using my trusty Toshiba Satellite 300 CDT. With this Intel Pentium 166MHz CPU and a whopping 60MB of RAM, this should more than meet our needs for this demonstration. Now it's time to install the software. You'll also need to install a driver so the computer can see the camera itself. Once you've done this, you can then connect the camera to the computer. Now that everything is installed for the camera, you can open up the software. First thing you need to do is make sure the board rate is exactly the same as the settings in the camera. This is the speed in which the data is transferred from the camera to the computer. I decided to try this at maximum speed. As with a lot of cameras of this time period, they use their own file format, so it wasn't just a case of dragging and dropping the folders over and viewing your pictures back instantly as JPEGs. In this instance, Sony has opted for the PMP picture format. So the first thing you need to do is to copy the photographs from the camera to the computer. And then select Copy Camera Album. This will copy the entire contents of the camera into the folder you selected onto the computer. And oh boy does this take some time. I think it worked out around 20 seconds for each photograph. Obviously that depends on the quality of the image itself. If they were higher quality then it would take even longer. Now that the album has been copied from the camera to the computer, you can view the photos back as thumbnails. You can actually do this from the camera itself as well, but with it being connected by a serial cable, the connection rate is quite slow. The software will only allow you to open up one photograph at a time for editing. After looking at your pictures in the album and deleting the ones you no longer want, you then have the option of saving them in one of three formats. Either bitmap, TIFF or JPEG. Looking back this process seemed a little long winded really, all that messing around choosing formats, when in the same year 1997 Sony's first Mavica came out, the FT5. This recorded its images straight to a floppy disk as JPEGs which would play back in any computer using Windows Internet Explorer. Let's see how the Sony F1 performs. Over the course of a couple of weeks, I took the camera out and about with me and took some pictures. Some of these are in fine, some are in standard. I can't remember which ones are which though. Considering this camera is nearly 24 years old, the pictures don't look too bad really. Oh, that's where I parked the car. While the camera does have a fixed focus lens, it does have a macro mode too, which works surprisingly well. You also get Yuli's Photo Express 1 bundled in with the software. This allows you to do various editing, making calendars and such. There is also another piece of software called Ixla Photo, which allows you to do various effects. One of the other neat features about this camera, and other cameras like it from the same era, is they always included a composite video output. And this will allow you to plug your camera directly into your TV via the AV inputs on the front. That way you could just play your images back straight from the camera in slideshow mode. I actually have two of these cameras, the first one which I got back in 2009, and the second one I got in the later half of 2020, the box one. I actually took some photographs back in 2009, and they were actually still stored in the internal flash memory. I was quite surprised. I thought they may have degraded over the last 12 years. 
And here is one of those pictures. It's hard to believe that this has survived being stored in the camera's memory for 12 years. The camera was powered up a couple of times in that time period, but even so. Another way you can transfer files with these cameras is via infrared, IRDA. Seeing as I have two of these cameras, I'm going to try and send one file to another, see if it actually works. Once you've enabled the wireless feature in both cameras, you just need to go into transfer mode. You then select the photograph or photographs that you want to send. Then on the other camera, you go into receive mode and face the cameras to each other. And there you go, it's transferred. It still amazes me that you could do stuff like this with such old technology. Shortly after the release of the F1, two other models were introduced, the F2 and the F3. Both had increased battery life due to new improved circuitry and a power saving mode. It looks however that these were only available in Japan. The F3 also came in black and had 8 megabytes of internal flash memory. The image chip was also slightly larger. Screen resolution however was still at 640 by 480. The F3 also boasted the option of being able to record 5 seconds of video. Something else to note about the F1 is the exclusion of the Sony's famous Cybershot logo. This didn't appear until the F2 and the F3 models and is still in use today in 2021. Well I must say I found this camera to be quite impressive considering when it came out back in 1997. It was a lot of money and in the very same year as I mentioned before the Sony Mavicas came out and I think if I had a choice I would have gone for the Mavica because it records straight to a floppy disk in a JPEG format which you can play back in pretty much any computer. In saying that though the Sony DSC F1 is quite versatile. I love the flip lens so you can tilt the screen at the back whilst holding the lens in a certain position to get that shot. And the fact that you can transfer pictures via infrared absolutely fascinates me. I haven't actually tried sending them to the Toshiba laptop itself because that does actually have an infrared port but I don't see why it wouldn't work. One of the other things that surprised me about this camera was the fact that the batteries still worked. They still hold a charge and in fact the more I've charged them the longer they've lasted. For a 25 year old or nearly 25 year old battery that's just amazing. I'm probably getting about 10 or 15 minutes out of it before it starts telling me that it needs to be charged. While I had a lot of fun using this camera the only thing that went against it really was the software. It was very clunky and it took me quite a few attempts to actually master it. I shall definitely carry on using this camera especially to get those retro camera shots you can only get with a camera of this age. Well I hope you enjoyed watching that, it was certainly very interesting to make. It's always interesting looking back at all technology and seeing just how far we've come. We're quite spoilt today with uh, technology in regards to smartphones, just selecting an app to take a photograph and editing it straight away. I still remember the days of 35mm and having to send it off to be developed and waiting two weeks for it to come back just to see that most of the pictures were blurry. Well I think that's just about it for today's episode. As always thank you for watching and I'll be seeing you.